This is an example of a single story, single bay portal frame. We got 10 foot uh, width, 10 foot height, and um, two columns that are this identical 600 inches to the fourth moment of inertia, both steel, and the beam is steel, but it has a moment of inertia of 800 inches to the fourth. We got a distributed load of 3 kip per foot going downwards and a lateral load of 10 kips. We're going to focus just on gravity load analysis and an approximate approach to things. It'll be useful in thinking about what the extremes of the beam situation might be. It's rigidly attached to the column, so that means when it attempts to want to rotate at the ends, it's, not, it's going to be partially strained by the flexural stiffness of the columns. So then a key question becomes, well, do we have um, columns that look relatively stiff compared to the beam or the other way around? Right? And you know from previous work that we've done that one way to think of, begin to think about that is just the I over L of each column compared to the I over the L of the beam. In this case, since the lengths are the same, 10 feet and 10 feet, then it becomes really about the moments of inertia, which you can barely uh, read at the font size here, but that would be 800 again for the uh, beam and 600 for the column. And so I would expect that the beam is a little bit stiffer by about a third compared to that of the, the columns when you look at the I over the L and given that the E's are all the same. So that means that if I look at the two possible extremes that the beam could be simply supported like a hinge that could be at either end or that the column is extremely st stiff so therefore as far as the beam is concerned it looks like two fixed ends then Given that the beam is stiffer than what the columns are, I, I think maybe we might be closer to this um, simply supported beam kind of situation. The way we do it in practice is we say, well, in this case we have zero moment, or you could also regard that as the inflection points, uh, because that's how that all works. The curvature, m over ei, um, is, gives us the inflection points. Those are zero when the moment is zero. And so we have points of inflection here on both ends because that's where the moment is zero. Now, in this other case, what we'll find out, perhaps through the flexibility method, is that this point of the moment being zero, or our point of inflection, is going to be theoretically 0.21L in both cases. So 21% of the span length as we transition from concave down to concave up. So our real situation will be somewhere in between that then, and the common rule of thumb is oftentimes to assume that that inflection point might be at a tenth of the span length. Now there's perhaps a lot of conditions under which you might actually see something like that. Uh, this may be a, a reasonable kind of uh, situation where we only have, in effect, one loading here. We don't have any loading on the column that are uh, distributed, or if this was a three-span beam, then we'd only have the load in the, the middle. Now, doing this means, you know, this again, this is assumed location. Oops. Assumed location of the inflection point. At 0.1L. Again, the inflection point is where the moment is zero, so we've just reduced the level of static determinancy by quite a lot when we do this. And that's really what we want to do is let's turn this into a situation where it's a lot easier to work with, meaning it's statically determinate. And if this is the case for this particular situation, then what we've got is then a beam that is eight tenths of the span, or in this case because the span is uh, ten feet, then this little shorter span where the inflection points are, or the insertion of a little hinge, then is only eight feet long, and we've got the distributed load on there. That's just a simply supported beam, and we know quite easily that then the reaction or the shears to that will be equal, and there's a WL over 2, W being 3 times the 8, that's 24 divided by 2, so we get 12 kips. And again, because we assume that the moment is 0 there, then that there's nothing else to, to show. 
that's kind of that is not just kind of it is very convenient because then we come along and we look at the rest of the scenario there is a caveat to all this that we'll have to talk about in just a moment pun intended And so, don't forget now, this is not an infinitesimally close segment, so we got to get the load in here at 3 kips per foot. We've got the 12 kips of the shear coming in. We have no moment, but we do have, um, oops, let me get the finite distance here. We do have a possible axial force in the beam, and that's kind of important, right, because if we're just going to try to squeeze this down, I anticipate that we get deflected shape with two fixed ends at the bottom that might look something like this. And the other one would be really symmetric to that, mirror image to that. And then we'd have some sort of little frowny face before we pick up the smiley face. And if we were to let go sideways, this thing would want to kick out just like it would on the other side. In other words, there has got to be a shear at the base of the column, which means that for equilibrium, we've got to have an axial force in our beam. And we don't know what that is. right? So that's maybe something we have to be somewhat careful and thoughtful about here. So let's see how this might all, again, begin to play out. We'll have, of course, an axial force down here, the reaction dy, and then we've got that potential dx of the column shear, and then given the deflected shape we just drew, looks like the reaction really should be in this direction, not as shown here. So let's turn that over. And so that's moment at d, we've got dx, dy. And so now sometimes people will talk about assuming what these shears might be, but we don't really need to do that too much, I don't think. Let's just take a look. Sum of forces in the y, then dy has to be the 12 kips, plus then the 3 times the 1 to get 3 kips out of that, or 15 kips, which of course is one half of the total load that we had in the original system. Makes sense that that dy then would be 15 kips. We do it likewise on the other side and you get 15 kips over there too. Right? And with that then, we might have enough. I don't know, we have to kind of begin to piece this out. If we sum moments right here, then we will get rid of, of course, the axial force up here. We'll get rid of the 12 kip, we'll get the dy, which we now know, and we get dx, which we don't. Ah, but we've got that moment sitting there. That's kind of a stinker doodle. So what if we were to sum moments here? Well, we get rid of the dy, which we know. We get rid of the axial force, which we don't. And we get md, and we get the dx. Huh. Well, that stinks. Uh, because now we still have, I think that, yeah, we still have two unknowns. Well, what if we sum moments down here? Well, we get rid of dx and dy, and but now we got the axial force. So the, one of the keys, there's probably another way that we might begin to do this, but note here, with the symmetric situation, the, this is set up such that we're not going to have any sway given the symmetry of the structure and the loading and the supports in this particular situation. So if we go over and consider, I'm going to do something kind of fancy. It may not apply in every situation, but effectively what we've got is a, a little flagpole that does not have any sway up at the top. In other words, a propped cantilever. And if we look at it that way, the statically equivalent set of forces are that we've got an axial force that comes from that 12 kip plus the 3, so that's 15 kips of force coming down there. We're going to have some sort of that force that represents the axial force there, and we will have a moment that's applied here. Right? And that moment would be equal to, in that case, just from this, would be equal to the 12 plus the 3 times the 1. That gets the total load times then 
one half for the moment arm, and that 12 should have been, of course, times a one foot also. So 12 plus 3 times the point 5 is 13 and a half kip feet. And in this situation, we know that the deflected shape is going to look like this. And we've done this enough before, too, to know that we end up with a moment at this far end. right? This is like a fixed fixed beam where we put a moment, rotate this, and we get a carryover moment of a half getting reflected down. So this m sub d is going to be equal to 13.5 divided by 2. And that, of course, would be 7.7, uh, 7, no, 6.75, almost 7 kip feet. All right, so the key that made this model reasonable is that we actually don't have any sway up there, and that's what allowed to create this particular model. And from there, then, we can uh, do the rest of the work here. Um, if, now that we know that, we can, hey, with a total moment trying to rotate this thing, it's going to be 20.25. So this set of lateral forces has to be a force couple that resists that. And so that'll be 20.25 kip feet divided by 10 feet, or 2.025 kips. So that actually allows us then to, to have a, a reasonably complete kind of model here. Uh, the last thing I want to do is to go draw the moment diagram that would then go along with this kind of situation. Right, so I'll put this down at the bottom in the space that we have available, but you can still see much of what's on the screen. I'm going to make the scale maybe a little bit slightly larger. Um, the beam length in the column height should be the same. I'm not doing that just to try to make it a little easier to sort of work with. Um, the note, we've got these end moments on the column. The arrow points to the side, the compression side of things, so that's kind of helpful here. And so the one at the bottom is half of what was at the top, so there's our 6.75. I'm not going to worry about plus and minus on this uh, right at the moment. That's a little bit arbitrary here. And the one at the other end is twice as big. So let's see, I used a scale that was like that. I probably should have checked my scale just a little bit more carefully when I was doing this. I'm going to go ahead and sort of do mirror image things on the other side of things, because of course the other column at the left will be the opposite of that one. And I know that that top one is 13.5. I don't want to write it yet because I want to go ahead and get the other um, moment diagram in. So there we go there. There we go there. Now we have a distributed load on the top, so that means we're going to have a second order curve. We know that in the middle here is where the maximum moment is going to be. And we know for a simply supported span, maximum moment is WL squared over 8, where L takes on the role of, of 8 feet. So 3 times, you know, I'll do it 64 divided by 8, or 24 for a net there. And we had this at 13.75, so I really did make this way too, uh, the scale way too big. Um, it would look something like this relatively to scale, and it's going to be a little hard to draw that in. But we'll give it a shot here. It'll be something a little bit like this. Ooh, I kind of like the way this is playing out. And the reason why I like the way it's playing out is that, remember, we had an assumption about where the inflection point was located. It's one foot over from the edge. The tenth of that span was one foot. And not that the French curve is, I changed my label of feet to make it a little bit more apparent that it was feet. Not that my my um, French curve is really second order, but it did, sure did kind of get us in the, the right spot here. 6.75 there, 13.5 at the top, 
of the columns. Then for the beam, I do put the negative in there to make it easier to, to see what's going on here. And we have the 24 for the moment diagram. There. This is all approximate, and it's only as good as our assumption of the location of those two uh, inflection points.